Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Peace processes, like true love, never run smooth. But few breakdowns attract the attention that the rejection in our referendum of the long and painful process of bringing about an end to the bloody conflict in Colombia has. A 50-year war, more than 50 years actually, has been waged there between the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia, the FARC, and the Colombian state. The process was supposed to leave the FARC unarmed and in the political system. Instead, the narrow rejection of deal has plunged the country and the region into deep uncertainty. Joining us to discuss it is journalist Nick McWilliam, who was in Colombia during the campaign. Nick, thanks for coming okay. on board. Thanks for what went us. wrong? Um, Everybody assumed this was a done deal. Yeah, me, uh, me included. Um, what went wrong? It's a very broad question. I mean, um, people are still talking about that. People are still not defined an actual an actual cause. Um, there's been everything has been listed as as factors in the in the no vote success from um, the hurricane the hurricane which hit the Caribbean coast um, on election day. Oh, sorry, election day, referendum day, um, which prevented a lot of people from voting. Where in the Caribbean uh, cities, Cartagena. Santa Marta in these regions, the yes vote was polling very highly. Um, the hurricane, they, people are saying, could have prevented up to four million people from voting. Wow. Um, That's a good that, reason to run yeah. it again, isn't the, it? Not? Well, it's Matthew, let's no? get, let's get, Hurricane Matthew, it was, uh, was it? Yeah, Matthew, that's the one. Yeah. Um, the difference between the yes and the no vote was 55,000 people. So, you know, you've got all this amount of um, people who were unable to vote. But that's just one reason being put forward. Um, there, there's been several. There's also the fact that there was perhaps a sense of complacency on the part of the, of the Juan Manuel Santos government, in the sense that they staged this very elaborate and celebratory signing ceremony in Cartagena mm. the week before the yeah. referendum, which kind of, with hindsight, seems yeah. a bit arrogant now. Yeah. And perhaps, one, angered no voters, um, which, as we see, was quite a large now proportion of the country, and two also gave the sense that uh, peace was a formality, mm. and and therefore perhaps create this sense of complacency that people didn't necessarily need to go and vote. You know, peace was coming and and great, and everybody's celebrating. Those are kind of a couple of reasons, but there's deeper reasons than that. I mean, one, um, the Colombian right um, was. V campaigned very strongly for the no vote, the political right, led by the former president Alvaro Uribe uh, and his political party, the the Democratic Center, um, was played. Not very democratic and well, not very centrist. They're not very centrist, definitely not. No, they are Colombians who I spoke tend to call them the, la ultra derecha, the mm. ultra right, not mm. even the extreme right, the mm. ultra right. So Uribe was the president between 2002 and 2010. He enacted a very military um, response to the insurgency. Um, violence and the conflicts kind of peaked under Uribe. Uh, this was also when things like Plan Colombia, which is the um, agreement with the United States for military funding for Colombia, was mainly enacted, and the US was putting billions per year into, into Colombia's war economy, ostensibly on, on a counter-narcotics war on drugs um, kind of mission. Um, but, you know, researchers found that this was much more focused on counterinsurgency um, and was the Colombian military um, actions engaged under the Plan Colombia rubric were, by and large, in, in regions controlled by the FARC. So, so Uribe's kind of political background, well, presidential background, his, it goes much um, prior to that as well. Shows the kind of his attitude towards the insurgency. So in 2010, Uribe was replaced by Juan Manuel Santos, who is the 
current president of Colombia. And Santos, who acted as the Uribe's defense minister and perhaps had been expected to continue this kind of militarized um, yeah. Hawkish, attitude. Yeah. yeah, exactly, hawkish, towards the FARC, um, kind of switched. And that was perhaps unexpected. He even, you know, he was photographed shaking hands with the FARC leader. So yes, exactly. Um, well, this is Santos and Uribe are consistently portrayed in the Colombian media as like mortal enemies now. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, Santos betrayed Uribe because he he then suddenly you know advocated this peace uh, and negotiations with the FARC. Santos is no angel. Though. Let's let's be mm -hmm. let's be clear on that. His his record under Uribe someone, is not uh, particularly. No, of course, but only someone on the right could have made this uh, peace deal. It's like Nixon and the recognition of China. Uh, it needed someone like Santos, uh, who had a right wing constituency, to say, "Look, I fought them, and now it's best that we end this war by diplomatic uh, means." Colombia has become a byword in recent decades for horrific abuse of human rights, trade union leaders and activists being murdered and disappeared, and uh, a kind of gangster regime, uh, an American imperialist outpost mm -hmm. in Latin America, mm -hmm. at a time when most of Latin America was moving to the left, now beginning to change. Um, how accurate was that picture? Uh, of Colombia, and was that a contributory factor to the FARC's long-standing uh, military campaign? Were they given basically a steady stream of recruits and support by virtue of the right-wing nature of these governments? Um, I would say yes, it was a factor. Um, so, this Colombia is a very fragmented country historically. Uh, it's kind of been split between urban, well, its, it's political domination has been through um, urban liberals and conservative rural landowners. Now, uh, Uribe is very much represents that conservative landowner sector. Um, those groups, well, I mean, you're going a long way back in Colombian history now, but those groups, um, the, the dominant groups, have traditionally used violence as a means of furthering their interests, furthering their economic um, plans. Um, and they have done that through a political system which has marginalized vast sectors of Colombian society. Colombia is a very, um, it's geographically fragmented, but it's also very socially fragmented. You have a very large indigenous population, a very large African descendant population who have never been incorporated into the, into the body politic when these groups have organized, have mobilized, which they do regularly, and I was out there covering um, at the end of May, beginning of June, there was a, a nationwide strike, the Paro Agrario, the, um, an agrarian strike, they call it, um, which reflected this sense of disenfranchisement of, of these kind of marginalized groups where, who have disproportionately suffered from the conflict. They have their communities are destroyed by resource extraction, um, things like coca um, eradication policies, which uh, involve aerial spraying. Um, this aerial spraying destroys crops, uh, kind of pushes people, economic deals in Colombia push certain communities towards coca production because it's more resilient than normal crops, it's economically viable. If the choice is that or starvation, then, you know, it's. Mm. Um, that's, of course, what people are forced into doing. Um, and yes, the state has been historically absent. Um, there is not infrastructure in large parts of Colombia. There's not education, health, the, uh, and there's insecurity. And the FARC in certain regions have, have provided that. They have provided a sense of social structure. And their recruitment pool has not been small. You know, they, 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 the state has been a historical oppressor of large parts of the society um, and uh, and yeah for, for many of them their, their, their primary engagement with the state is through is through conflict is through the military rather than through health or through education one region that um, which is this is an ongoing crisis in Colombia which is very very rarely reported on is in the far north you have uh, a desert region on the Caribbean coast called uh, La Guajira uh, in the last 
since between 2008 and 2013, more than 4,000 indigenous children died in this region uh, through uh, lack of water, malnutrition, and preventable diseases. Um, you know, the media barely reports on it. Mm. Whereas Venezuela, you know, there's some stuff not available and the supermarket becomes... Become the, main, the main, main. So yeah. it's like this imbalance in reporting and, and that can also be traced back to the failed referendum. Just this morning I was reading an article about how the Colombian media, which is very much a corporate media in the hands of a few yeah. elite interests... That's often. Um, ..how it has misrepresented violence in Colombia, so, conflict. So I see there's obviously certain circumstances that has caused the no result, mm -hmm. uh, which otherwise would have been a yes, obviously. Because so what, what are the other really people who have, you know, solid arguments for this no vote? What, what, what solution well, do you see otherwise? Okay. What is it, how is it going to look like? One thing that the right... Yeah, they've got an alternative plan. Who? The, no. the the no vote camp. I, I mean, do they really want to go back to the war? Um, um, they say not. Um, but, you, you know, the war has had a... War is big business, right? Mm. So war has advanced the interests of certain economically powerful groups or elites in Colombia. Not only in Colombia, but Colombia is a, is, sure. a, is a good example of this. By the war has displaced, you know, very large communities in Colombia. Um, Colombia has between six and seven million internally displaced people. Um, it's, uh, along with Syria, it's the first or second um, highest number of internal displaced in the world. Now, what this does is it opens up large parts of the country to foreign or, or, or national, but resource extraction, uh, agro-industry, mm. these these very powerful mm. multinational economic interests mm. um, which have benefited from the war. Mm. Now, a lot of people when I was out there, um, I spoke to a lot of people, you know, displacement victims, mm. uh, men members of indigenous communities, human rights activists, a lot of these people felt that one of the underlying motives of the peace process was uh, about opening up the country to international investment. Colombia is mm. very, very rich in mineral resources. Uh, there's a Latin American conference, of course, in November. I'm, I'm there sure. every year. That's going As to I, be... Uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll be there. I will be. Yeah. Thanks very much for joining us, Nick. Coming up next, the art of the Russian Revolution. Who could forget it? Stay tuned. Welcome back to Sputnik. The October Revolution of 1917 famously described by the American writer John Reed as 10 days that shook the world, continued to reverberate for many decades and gave birth to many things, good and bad, including new forms of art, of socialist realism, which, though not without critics, has never really gone out of fashion, endlessly being rehashed as perhaps the ultimate in retro. And so when we heard of the film New Art for a New World, we just knew it would be on anybody's DVDs collection on board the Sputnik. I'm glad to say that we can welcome BAFTA award-winning director Margie Kinmouth to talk about her latest project. You came to an open door here. This show is called Sputnik. <laughs> it's on RT. Uh, we are uh, big uh, fans of uh, uh, post-revolutionary Russian art. Uh, and so when we heard about your film, we just had to have you. Thanks very much for coming on board. Tell us about the film. Well, I was inspired to make the film about the revolution because I've made four films about Russia, Russian history, Russian art, Russian culture, and it's the kind of place that's just teeming with stories that have not been told, and every single story seemed to revolve around the revolution. So when the anniversary came along, I thought this is my opportunity to do something that honours and celebrates the artists, because although the, the politics, the story of the politics is better known, we don't know that much about the artists and what, what happened to them afterwards. They were infused with the idea that the October Revolution was going to bring about a new world, and therefore it, a new world needs a new art. Tell us what forms emerged at that time and how they've stood the test of time. Well, the painters were already up and running because you had, you know, Popova and so on who'd already started doing abstract 
art and the painters were you know there were a lot of them they're very influenced by French cubism by Picasso and so on who'd been exhibited there in Moscow mm. let's take but, a look at one of those one of the classics okay. Tell us this, talk us through this one. Well, this is Malievich, who, of course, is he's the star of my film because his story runs right the way through the whole period. And my, my film... He's the best known of that yeah, period, exactly. really. He's, he's yeah. the best known because he... of the black square. So the black square was his way of going back to ground zero, if you like, and um, throwing away figurative work, throwing away everything and starting all over again and saying the art is the only thing that matters and this was called supremacy and were they following Picasso or was Picasso following them <laughs> he he drew away from Picasso I mean obviously they loved cubism but they took their own form everything in Russia is extreme they're much more extreme than the French so they took these ideas and just ran with them in the most crazy extreme way and then when the October Revolution came along um, they were all See, infused she likes the first, I like the second. This yeah. is socialist realism at its best. The Bolshevik. I mean, nobody yeah. is in any doubt what that painting is about and who it represents. And there are the masses uh, converging on the power to change and make, a, make a, a new world. This is less respectable as an art form. I, yeah, that well, might this be why of, I love it so much. Well, this <laughs> became more of the thing later on. This is called The Bolshevik by Kostodiev, and he did, you know, a lot of his work was figurative, and it showed the cities, and it sort of demonstrated the politics with the banners and the flags and so on. Um, but really, it was the abstract artists, and then the photographers were very important. Mm. And they were all very, very young in 1917. They were the first wave of Bolsheviks. They really believed in the revolution and what it was going to really going to change things. And so they worked with Lenin, and Lenin asked them to work with him. They were doing the propaganda posters. They were creating photo, um, photo realism, photo montage, designing these adverts that would later become the prototypes for today's capitalist advertising. Mm, mm. Who's this one now? The, this is Petra Bodkin, who's less well known here. And it's very beautiful. He was, I mean, an extraordinary painter who's very well known also for his still lives. And um, so this is called Fantasy. And again, this is quite a kind of, you know, it's an image which depicts exactly what it is, this, this idea of the red horse flying over the cities. Mm. and. The New Hope. He survived later in Stalin's time by keeping himself well under the parapet and um, he didn't do any propaganda. He kept a low profile. He was a teacher in the art school so he had a job because remember they were very poor. They were starving, a yeah. lot of them. Mm. And they needed well, to work. Well, artists are supposed to starve for at least a little while. But this is long before the art market. They, just, they weren't selling their work. So, in but the none same of them were selling really, yeah? Yeah. But he later on, he did these sort of coded pictures. And you'll see in my film the way that he, he sort of took the form into the Stalin period of the 30s, managing to portray these houses and these people, you know, maybe looking away with their backs to you, maybe doing extraordinary still lives of just one single fish, which would be a sort of symbolic thing about starvation or a little crust. And so he really did reflect what was happening and it's amazing that he survived and um so this is a documentary feature length documentary yeah, we it, know about those mm -hmm. we just <laughs> made one uh, ourselves um it's going to be on cinemas here and internationally yeah T tell us your main struggles in making this film well it's always difficult to get funding i mean every single film i make te seems to take you know a lot of time to get Tell the money. This it. was very difficult. We had to sell our house for hours. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm of glad it. you didn't have to do that. <laughs> well, it, it was. Um, but you had to anticipate for the an uh, anniversary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I had well, to the do... timing is perfect. Yeah. Well, that's so, all. Yeah. Uh, it will soon be the centenary. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I suppose I'm lucky. I've always made films around art and artists and pe people who are creative. You did one, a great one on the Hermitage. Yeah. Yeah, and that was. Um, I'd been invited by the Hermitage Museum to make their anniversary film, and that went really well. It went out in like 30 or 40 countries around the world, playing theatrically. You know, it really did good business so I said we had that model of distribution 
And I thought, well, I'll see if I can repeat that with Revolution, this new film. And it was slightly more difficult because the, the politics, the, the, the sort of world situation had become a bit yeah. more well, challenging. Well, can I ask you about that? I mean, it isn't... I mean, it's great timing for the anniversary, the centenary, but it's pretty bad timing because of this rise and rise of uh, Russophobia. How much of a problem was that for you and how much of a problem will it be in getting people into the cinemas? Well, we'll see. I mean, this is due to have a wide release on November the 10th all over the country, all over Europe, and then it's opening in America in March. So we'll sort of see if, if the Russian thing affects the ticket. What if Donald <laughs> Trump gets elected as president? <laughs> he well, might well, come the, along and cut the ribbon. Well, we'll all be going on your, your spaceship somewhere, I think. <laughs> if if Hillary Clinton wins, she'll probably close your film down. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you are... A but well, it was mercy. difficult to get the funding. I mean, the BBC, you know, they're not keen to look at these political things. Russia, they're very afraid of it. No. So, um, you know, that wasn't my first port of call. But because the cinema is now a place where people go to look for art, it's, you know, there is an audience there. But, I mean, I think that art and culture is a very good way of, you know, cutting right through these borders and sort of joining us together in a good way in, in the long term. And, um, you know, so... It, you hope the conflict, you know, can be resolved through sort of art and culture yeah. as a way of meeting with these people. And I have really good relationships with the, the Russians that I've worked with. You know, with Gergiev, I've made two films with him, the conductor, and, you know, it's been a most extraordinary experience. So, um, well, it's just like the Sputnik exhibition that uh, was on recently. Yeah, the, the cosmonauts. The cosmonauts. Yeah. yeah, which was obviously, which was also a fantastic success. Yeah, Despite well, you have the... certain museum directors like you know Zilfera Trigulova, who is at the the Trechikov, and she's a very outward-looking person. So she shared the work there with the science yeah, museum. Yeah, I mean, but it needs two to tango, doesn't it? And mm. uh, to be fair, uh, it was the. British Science Museum that put together the cosmonauts uh, and all that material for the very first time. It hadn't been done in Russia, let alone sent by Russia mm. uh, out to the world. Yeah. How do you find the environment in Russia now on these kind of issues? Uh, is it a cooperative one? Do they want to get their story, their art, their culture out to the world? Well, there's two things. I mean, there's the paintings and so on, which I found in the museums, and each museum is different. Some of them are easy to work with, and some of them you feel they're very old Soviet institutions that don't want to reach out. So, you know, I had to find my way of getting my cameras in and filming there behind the scenes in the storerooms where it's overflowing with amazing paintings. Amazing. But the, the great thing about my film is I have the descendants of the artist in the film, and so... I've interviewed these extraordinary contributors with the most heartbreaking stories, and those were more difficult to get to. You know, these people are kind of shy, they haven't been filmed before, um, they truly believe they have nothing to say. You have to really, you have to go on and on ringing them up. They don't have answer phones or emails or anything, and you gradually get their trust. And so I sort of did numerous visits and talked to people, and then I gradually go with my camera, and so I built up, so the story of the film, the main ballast of the story, is from the descendants of the artists. And I always like to tell from the artist's point of view, I think this is a really good way of telling a story, not just yeah. history curators, yeah. but artists, you know, with all the complications, the complexities of making things, I love... I love hearing the artist's mm. point and of view. So I understand well, that you use, you've got actors as well in this documentary yeah. Film, yeah, who portray these artists. Yeah, well that was the other thing that um, some of the artists of 100 years ago were also very good writers. So um, Kandinsky wrote a great deal and I, so I needed and somehow to bring his words into the story so he's telling his own story and then Malievich is a you know fabulous writer so Tom Hollander plays Malievich in the film, he brings him to life yeah. with the paintings and the extraordinary... Good neighbour too. <laughs> wonderful <laughs> neighbour. <laughs> well look, it's a actor. great start to what's going to be a momentous year uh, in uh, Russian affairs, Russian history. The very best of luck with your film. Thanks for coming on board the Sputnik, Margie. 
And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So on the Colombia peace process, uh, we asked whether the country will now, how will they bounce back after the no votes? And Ricardo Picasso says, well, under relentless U.S. attack, their Latin American fighting spirit is now more than ever. And Agatocles says, Santos and FARC are to be commended, but ultimately there's no peace without justice. Well, that's right. And if FARC have sold the pass in making the deal that they did, they'll be replaced by someone else uh, if the people's uh, needs are unmet exactly. by this yeah. process. Then new forms of struggle will arise. And that's all that we've got time for today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on social media, Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik, or Facebook. Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.